And can I ask you why, philosophically, just to really drill into this, why should people care about free speech? And, and do you think there's anything that, you know, where should we draw the limits? Should there be limits and where should we limit, draw them? Um, I have a, a slightly different philosophy on free speech than most people. Um, and mine is probably one of the more expansive theories that you're going to run into. Um, and uh, so the marketplace of ideas is sort of the dominant metaphor uh, 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 in First Amendment law that basically, and this is Oliver Wendell Holmes, you know, gr great jurist, great genius, um, you know, who we were very lucky to have on the Supreme Court and became one of the first champions of freedom of speech. Um, kind of an unlikely choice to be champion of freedom of speech. And at first, actually, he was he, he was very skeptical of it. And it was him and Louis Brandeis who eventually really radicalized the First Amendment and um, uh, made it powerful. But he, uh, his argument was that essentially, uh, and him and Brandeis's, was that you wanted a marketplace of ideas where essentially uh, things can battle out for dominance and presumably not necessarily the best would win, uh, but some of the bad ideas would fail. Um, it, it wasn't, they didn't have any kind of um, hyper um, optimism about the idea that good ideas will always succeed, but, the, but truth doesn't have a standing, uh, a fighting chance when you can't even say it, <laughs> basically. Mm. But I go a step further. I think that the value of freedom of speech is very simple, but very essential to any society. It's knowing what people really think, period. And I don't just believe that from a point of view of uh, democracy. Uh, and that's where marketplace of ideas makes the most sense. The marketplace of ideas metaphor makes most sense in two, diff two different places, democracy uh, and in scholarship. Uh, in the idea of battling out ideas, that, that's about the battle of ideas. But it's only about this kind of small piece of, of, of the pie. Most of freedom of expression is simply letting people be themselves and knowing what makes them tick and knowing what they really think. And this is important from a democratic standpoint, shortly, um, because uh, and, and this is important from a from a scientific standpoint, because this is the whole humanist project. It's the project of human knowledge. It's to know what the world's actually like. And you know nothing about what the world is actually like if you don't know how people actually tick and what they really think. And therefore, I think I have a very expansive view of freedom of speech. And this includes things like, you know, I don't think people should be going to jail for conspiracy theories. Now, if they do something um, that crosses a line into, into conspiracy, uh, conspiracy to commit a crime, all that kind of stuff, our law actually handles that really quite well. But the fact that someone believes in a conspiracy theory is not just, um, uh, it's, it's, it's a worthwhile thing to know. And currently, right now, we have this QAnon phenomenon um, in, in the US. And it's much more, it's wild conspiracy theory. It actually led to someone um, shooting up a, a pizza bar um, that people like to go to in Washington, DC. It's like one of Cosmos, it's like one of our favorite places. And it's like, wow, you actually thought there was a child sex ring in, in the basement? Now, of course, anything that that, that person did towards uh, going and shooting up and all that kind of stuff, there are multiple illegal steps before that actually happened. Um, but it's really important to know that if you have these ideas in society, that people can actually talk about them. Because when you get people just talking to other people um, who already agree with them, uh, it has a very predictable social science effect. It, ca it causes people to be more radical in the position, that, uh, in, the, in the conspiracy mm -hmm. in some cases, but, or, but in the belief that they were. They get a sense of tribalism. They get, a, they get more arguments on their side, and it leads to a polarization spiral. So um, even, even conspiracy theories, not only do I think that they, are, uh, they should be protected, I think that they're worthy of study. Um, and I think that, for example, like the um, uh, elders of uh, uh, the Protocols of Zion, um, horrifying uh, idea that, that, that there's a, there was a Jewish conspiracy to dominate the world um, that came out in the, the teens or 20s, 1920s. But you have to study that because you have to understand what actually happened in the world. You have to be, be able to know what the world actually looks like. So my view overall on free speech is extremely expansive. Uh, but, but at the same time, I also, and, I, and this is where I, I, I'm, I'm a bad American, is that I show up in other countries and I say, Listen, I know I'm supposed to say, well, this is our system. It shouldn't be your system. Um, I actually, I, I throw that out the window. I'm like, listen, I think that the American First Amendment jurisprudence has been some of the best thought out meditations on how you have free speech in the real world as, as someone actually in charge. Um, and that I think that those exceptions that we, cr that we created in First Amendment law make a lot of coherent sense. Not, not necessarily perfectly in, in all of them. But for example, that, that's why incitement 
is not protected in the United States. And, and, but it, it can't just be, hey, I think we should overthrow the government. It has to be a situation where you're actually about to go and do uh, said, uh, you know, said behavior. Libel is not protected, uh, you know, for, for example, which is claiming falsely, uh, and particularly when it comes to public figures, knowingly knowing something's not true and saying this person's committed some heinous act like a pet, pedophilia is, is one of the examples that's given that's not protected um we do have uh, what, what i think are just uh, in line with human nature ability to restrict kids exposure to sexual content for example um first amendment lawyers uh, have trouble have trouble with that but I, I think that in the battle in the psychological battle between parents and uh the first amendment that if you can't actually do it, take any steps to sort of uh, keep your kids from seeing porn, that's going to lose. So I think we're very pragmatic on that. We have things like um, time, place, and manner restrictions that essentially, uh, you know, it's perfectly reasonable to stop someone on the basis of their, their decibel level from having a concert, uh, you know, in Central Park at four o'clock in the morning. Um, so it's a very coherent body of law, but what makes it different from other countries is, uh, what, and one of the main things that makes it different is the bedrock principle. And the bedrock principle, it comes from a case about uh, burning American flags. And it's simply that you can't ban something just because it's offensive. Understood. Uh, well, that brings us to universities. Uh, you, uh, after a 2007 study, I think, said that uh, uh, a lot of the codes on, uh, in American universities in relation to free speech were laughably unconstitutional. Uh, in fact, I think you said most of them, if not three quarters of them. What were some of the worst examples of violations of free speech protection on campus? And I must say, I was amazed to hear that some of them have free speech zones on campus. Yes. What are they? Yeah, um, I mean, I wrote a whole book on the worst violations from, uh, fr from that point in my career. Um, and free speech zones are one of the ones that just really particularly drive me nuts. Um, and these keep on cropping their head up uh, and, and they're taking advantage of this time, place and manner restriction idea where essentially they say, you know, this campus loves free speech so much. We're going to um, set aside one lone gazebo on campus. This was really the case at Texas Tech University and Texas Tech University is one of the biggest universities physically in the whole country. They have 28,000 students and they were trying to tell people that you got one a uh, 20 foot wide gazebo to exercise your free speech, which included handing out pamphlets, handing out magazines. Um, and that was laughably uh, unconstitutional. Uh, and we challenged that um, with the help of a Christian litigation group and it, it, it was defeated. Um, but I mean, it's amazing. Like I, I, I see a case right now um, that we see on the United States where it's a professor who um, had an exam question that included um, a reference to racial epithets. Um, and, and it was B blank and N blank. Um, and, you, and one is for a, a derogatory, and then he had parentheses, one is a derogatory term for women and another one is a derogatory term for African-Americans. This is at law school um, where you're taking, you, every lawyer is required to take crim law. Crim law is grisly. It's, it's nonstop horror show of like really unlikely cases because we have a common law um, uh, country, uh, torts, you know, is, is grisly as, as well. And the idea that you would actually even have to, you know, excise out epithets because it, it, it somehow is no longer understood that you can talk about something without calling somebody something, which is something, a basic idea um, that, of education is that you can examine something as adults from the outside. But in this case, the professor even X'd it out but apparently making students think about those words was considered offensive enough that he's suspended. And this is uh, University of Illinois at Champaign, uh, what, a major university in the U.S. Um, and at a law school. And you have to wonder, it's like, how are these people going to practice law if they, if they can't even be reminded of some of the things that actually will happen, some of the horrible things that people will say in law practice or, or for the interesting things that people will study? Thank you for watching this episode. We appreciate your support. If you value vital conversations like this one, be sure to subscribe to the channel there and also click the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases.